Hello everyone, Steve Edelman here and my good friend and colleague, Schaefer Bader. We're both endocrinologists. I have diabetes, Schaefer does not, he's the loser. Uh, but we're going to talk today about an extremely important topic, continuous glucose monitoring and also other tips to ace your diabetes. But Schaefer previously gave an excellent talk on introducing people with type 2 diabetes to continuous glucose monitoring. That lecture is in our video vault on our website. And this presentation is a higher level of sophistication where we're gonna basically uh, tell you how to analyze your own CGM download, to look at your own data and try to help you figure out what's going on with your diabetes. And of course, to help you work with your healthcare professional. Yeah, and if you don't have a CGM, maybe this will be a good you know, um, lecture to watch to get motivated to go see if you should get a CGM. And even if you're not going to get a CGM, there's going to be tons of tips and tricks and updates and things that we're going to be sprinkling in using these cases that are CGM related. So, so this is going to apply to everybody. And let me just say up front that traditionally only people with type 2 diabetes taking multiple daily injections of insulin are supposedly eligible to get that paid for by Medicare and certain mm -hmm. insurance companies. But I can tell you that it's, it's a rare type 2 that really would not benefit from CGM, at least intermittent. And so don't let, don't let those rules stop you from getting one. Okay, let's, let's start. This is just a picture of several CGMs on the market. I'm not gonna get into details, but we have the Abbott Libre Flash, now the Flash, the Libre 2 on your upper left, the right is the Dexcom, and below is the implantable CGM called the Eversense. Now, what is a continuous glucose monitor? Basically, what it is is, and the systems are all fairly sim similar, except maybe the implantable Eversense, but they all involve a sensor. A sensor that will measure your glucose as often as every five minutes. That blood sugar gets transmitted to a Apple Watch, a handheld monitor, a, a phone, whichever system you're using, and you can look at it, you can get a lot of analytics on your phone. Uh, the Dexcom system and the Eversense have a share feature, so you can have loved ones follow your diabetes or at least be alerted when you're getting extremely low. So we're not here to tell you the nitty gritty of each one. Uh, you can visit those on, on our website when you click on uh, the company logo. There's information about them. And we also have other le lectures that talk about in detail. Yeah, great. Good background. So the real takeaway is that continuous glucose monitors provide way more information than the old test, which was either your A1C or a combination of your A1C and your glucose meter where you're pricking your finger at home. So the obvious, you know, first thing that it gives you is continuous glucose data, right? Just by their name, you can figure that out. And what that does is it allows you to basically make informed decisions about how to control your own diabetes. So it helps you take control of your diabetes by, um, you know, making better choices about your diet, um, you know, exercise, dosing your medications, especially if you're someone who uses insulin. It can really help guide those decisions and, and, and help support you to make better choices. I've seen it really motivate a lot of my patients with type 2 yeah. when they can see their blood sugars any time they want. Right. Plus they don't have to prick their finger, but it gives so much more than that. And then you can see in the upper right hand corner of the Libre, uh, the trend arrow. And that tells you what direction your blood sugar is going. And that has tremendous implications, yeah. both pharmacologically, like if you're giving yourself insulin, but also non-pharmacologically, delaying your meal, cutting mm -hmm. some carbs, going out for a brisk walk. So it allows you to improve your time and range, which we'll get to in a second. Yeah, that glucose trend is really important and it can help you again kind of make decisions under with more information. Another super important thing about CGM is the alerts and alarms. These can be set and individualized so that you're alerted if your blood sugar is high above a certain level or below a certain level. And it's super important, especially for people who are on insulin or other medications that can cause low blood sugar. So it's really a safety issue, but it's also going to help sort of guide you and keep in within that target glucose range, which we're going to talk a lot about today. Yeah. And setting your alerts is key mm -hmm. because if you make them too tight at first, when, you're, when your control is bad and your A1C is really high, they're going to drive you crazy. It's going to drive your partner crazy. And uh, so there's 
there's a whole etiquette to alerts and alarms. Let me just say, there's a great section in chapter 10 of the free TCOID book that you can get from our website, as well as the health fair mm. that talks all about alert and alarm settings, really important. And then to, to close this slide out, the big takeaway of this talk and some of our other talks is that this information is really for you, the patient, the person with diabetes to use to help guide your own care. And so what you can do is you can download all of your blood glucose data and, and review it in, in sort of in retrospect. So look back and see how was my blood sugar over the last week, month, 90 days, whatever. And that can really help you make decisions. And so this is important for your, your healthcare provider. Like we use it as, as doctors all the time. That's really important for us, but you can also use it too. So that's what we're gonna be teaching you today. Yeah, think about it. You're living with your diabetes 24 seven. How often do you see your caregiver? This information is vital for you. And the sooner you know how to use this technology, it's gonna make your life so much better. Well, so how, so you know, one, how do we actually get this information? I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this. Yeah. Each CGM has its own sort of app and different ways to approach it. But the point is, is that for each CGM that you choose, if you, if you find the right CGM for you, you're gonna be able to access these. And the reports basically look very similar. So each report is a little bit different, different app, a different website, but they all have the same information. And let me just say that if, if you're not looking at your own information and you just walk into your doctor's office every three, four, five months and say, you know, here's my meter, download it, and you've not looked at it, um, you're, you're missing out and you're, you're, you're missing out on the point of continuous glucose monitoring. Well, this is a slide of just some of the data. There's lots of ways you can look at it. Uh, you can see this one really focuses in on time and range. Mm -hmm. That's a super important, important metric that we believe is way more important than your A1C. Because this tells you how you're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. And then if we, so that was kind of a, a, an example of what you can see on a mobile app, just on your phone, if you're using one of these CGMs. Yeah. This ambulatory glucose profile is a report that would, this is what it would look like if you went and downloaded all your data. And kind of you could print this out or look at it on your computer or at the website. And it looks like there's like so much going on here. Like this is way above, you know, anybody's ability to make sense of this, but it's not. And so we're gonna show you how to kind of stepwise go through this piece by piece and make sense of your own data. So if you download your own report, you're gonna look at these things and you're gonna know exactly what they mean. So uh, I'm gonna get through each of these sections individually. Really important part of the talk today. Yeah, and so you know we'll, we'll talk about what these numbers mean, the average glucose. We're gonna spend some time on time in range and you know what you want your time, your target range to be and how much time to spend there. This is a, what we call a 24 hour modal day where it basically puts all your blood glucose data into one place and it shows you the trends throughout 24 hour day. And then finally, you can kind of go back and look at these specific days individually. So we're gonna kind of talk back through that a little bit more specifically. So this is really kind of our approach to looking at these reports in the clinic. So if, if we had a, a patient come in and we download a report, this is what we would do. And it's also a really good way to kind of do it yourself. Yeah, we, we do this so much. We don't need this laundry list, but it's really important for you to keep this list and go methodically down the line. Yeah. And so, you know, you can go back and watch this lecture later. You can take a snapshot. Yeah. Um, and once you've done it a couple of times, you won't need the list either. Yeah. But, but just to kind of, this will help guide you. The first thing that we always look at is the average glucose. It's not necessarily the most important thing, but it's kind of the first thing just to get us oriented. Mm -hmm. And then there's something called the glucose management indicator, which is sort of the fancy word, the GMI, that's a fancy word for the predicted A1C. So it's a little bit of a different calculation, but it's essentially your predicted A1C based on all of those blood glucose data points that are in your CGM. Yeah, you have control over how far back you want to show this summary data. So the GMI or the estimated A1C really is most accurate compared to the lab when you get the 90 day average. And I've, I've said this a zillion times, but uh, the estimated A1C or the GMI on your download is more accurate than the laboratory. Yeah, we, we tend to believe those too, because there's a lot of problems with the A1C sometimes. Um, the next thing we look at is the standard deviation or coefficient of variation. These are both different measures of variability, right? So how, how much higher lows and ups and downs kind of you have at, that, at a given time point. So if it, looking at standard deviation, our goal in general, just as a starting point, is less than 50. That just means you're not having a ton of ups and downs and kind of different yeah. blood sugars. And the reason why it's number two, because it's important, uh, because, you know, 
it's very tough to get your diabetes under control if you're if you're unpredictable swings. Right. Uh, you know, so that's a key number. And the very next thing that we look at is the time and range. And so time and range, again, we'll talk more about it and we'll show you a, a picture of what that looks like. But the first thing, probably the biggest thing to look at first is, you know, the hypoglycemia, time below range is what we call this. And this is basically the amount of time of your day, the percent of your day that you spend less than 70, if you have that as your setting. So you want that to be minimized. You don't want to be in hypoglycemia. So our goal is less than 5%, but lower is better. If you can get that down to 2% or 1% or 0%, that's a good thing. Yeah. The next thing we look at is the time in range or the time in ideal range. Um, and the goal there is to spend as much time as you can get. You wanna be in that range where you're not too high and not too low most of the time. And um, you know we wanna be at least 70% time in range. And then the rest of the time is time above range, which means you're high. Yeah, and the important thing to remember that when you look at these percentages, you know, 24 hours in a day, 100%, that one hour of being above or below your target goal will set you off four percentage points. Mm -hmm. I always think it's not fair. You work hard, 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 get your time and range up, and then you go over your limit, you know, your 180, whatever, we'll talk about the upper limit, yeah. for one hour, and you lose four percentage points. So it's important to, even though your low level may say one percentage point, that's it's, an hour. It's a meaningful amount of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So then the next things that we look at are the 24 hour modal day. And that's just to give you sort of a pattern throughout the day when you're having highs and lows and sort of areas to target in on. And then you can look at these individual days to tease out specific problem areas. And then finally, but definitely not least, as we talked about, you wanna review the alert settings on your CGM. Yeah, let me just say though that it sounds like a lot of steps, but a lot of times we'll see someone, their time and range is 85% with no lows, we're done. We just bill you the highest level and we, <laughs> we get on to the next patient because yeah. there's not much to fix. Yeah, so, so you're going to be going down this stepwise and then finding the point where you need to do something. Yeah, and yeah. it may not be until step five or step four. Yeah. Um, so it, and, and again, once you've done it a couple of times, it, it goes much quicker. So Steve, you want to kind of talk us through this a little bit? Yeah, this is just an example of a download. You can see the uh, estimated A1C is 6.6%. You got the mean glucose of 139. And then you got standard deviation, less than 50, you're at goal. Time and range, you can see there that you are 73%. Uh, and so you're, you, this person is doing pretty darn good. Yeah, so you can look at all those numbers in about 10 seconds, Yeah. right? And you yeah. get a really good idea of what's going on with this person's those CGM. Are, those are my data. That's very, uh, very good. Now this, this is key, everybody, pay attention. This is the time and range goals. Green is 70 to 180. And these goals were specifically uh, designed by diabetes experts from around the world that got together for a consensus conference. 70 to 180 is, is a range where that should be most of the pre and post meal blood sugars. As Schaefer mentioned a minute ago, 4% below uh, 70, but still above 55 and less than 1% below 55, and then you have the above range. Yeah, so, you know, that 70% time and range is really the takeaway. Minimize the time in hypoglycemia, and then the rest is gonna be hyperglycemia, which you're also gonna try to minimize, but it's by getting more numbers in the time and range. Now, um, we can kind of focus a little bit, Steve, just kind of go, you know, we talked yeah. about this a little bit yeah. more, but this is a 24 hour day. You can just build up this slide. Okay. This is just going through the examples that Schaefer did on the, the text slide. So you can see the 24 hour day, then you can look, look at all the days overlapped and then you can look at individual days. So it's- It just gets more and more granular and you don't always need that, but but it's kind of nice to have that data available. That's a great phrase, it, it gets more granular. I never yeah. use it, but- that's a perfect word. Next time you can Perfect you can time. Yeah. Okay, let's go to the next granular slide. <laughs> <laughs> so some of the take home points, right? Get familiar with the reports and what the numbers mean. Um, know your own goals. So this is something that, this is a moving target, but something you wanna figure out where you wanna be and kind of work towards it. Look at the average glucose, the standard deviation to judge your variability, the time in range and time below range, which is your hypoglycemia, to quickly identify big issues that you wanna focus on. Then you can kind of look at that overall pattern, the 24 hour day to hone in on specific times. You know, maybe it's at dinner time, maybe it's overnight where you're having highs or lows or something like that. And you can find that on that 24 hour day. 
And then once you identify that specific time of day, you can go into the overlays or the day by day, and there you go, get more granular and really kind of zoom in on those, those time points. Um, and then ultimately this whole process is just learning to sort of be your own end or at least you know your primary advocate you're the one who is who's living with this you know every day and and you, you see your doctor every few months you know we go through these same exact slides for healthcare professionals to yep. make them familiar with reading downloads not any different yeah. so so be your own endo and then when you go and see your provider you can say hey i downloaded my report this is the stuff i was looking at and they may say i don't know how to read this and you can teach them now in these next few cases we're gonna we're not gonna spend time explaining each metric because we've done that so we want to show you some real life examples this is a 72 year old male I take these are all real patients he's got lots of complications his a1c has always been high he's got heart disease he's got kidney disease uh, his he's got retinopathy uh, where diabetes has affected his eyes he takes Lantus anywhere between 10 and 25 units at night, which is the wrong take to, uh, wrong thing to do to, when you're taking basal insulin. You gotta be pretty consistent. He takes fast acting with each meal and he's not very good at being consistent with taking his medication. So take us through the metrics. So a little inconsistent, including his dosing. So let's kind of look at these numbers real quick. So honing on this, we have 28 days of data. Um, we see the average glucose down there, it's 207. So that's already a little high for an average blood sugar. Right, that matches up with a with an with basically an estimated A1C or a GMI of 8.3%. Glucose variability, this is 36%. That's the coefficient of variation. So that's you know we'd like it a little bit lower than that. His target range or time in range is only 39%. Right, so we need really want to get him to double that number eventually. Yeah, yeah that's and um, you know he does not having a lot of lows, but he is having some lows, 1%. So he's, you know, he's down there about 14 minutes a day. It actually says how many minutes a day. So he's going low, just not a lot. But the rest of the time is hyperglycemia. He's high pretty much all the time the rest of the day. Yeah, and he's got, he's got, he's, he's had a hard time taking control of his diabetes. So yeah. So this, if we look at the 24-hour modal day, well, we can see a couple of things. So you know, so to orient you on the far left, that's basically midnight. And then if you go halfway across the slide, that's, that's 12 noon, and then another 12 hours gets you back to midnight. So that's 24 hour day. And so this left side of the slide is, is actually overnight for this gentleman. And overnight, he does pretty good. I mean, he's still got some variability. You can see by how wide that purple area is, but he's in range much of the time. So he's in between those sort of dark gray lines that shows that he's in that target range. But once he wakes up in the morning and starts eating and goes about his day, his blood sugars go high, and he's pretty much there for the rest yeah, of the day. Yeah, I'll just point out that about, what about 10 p.m., 9 p.m. at night, when you look at the height between the bottom part of the purple shade and the mm -hmm. top, so he is very variable. Yeah, and that, he, that shows glucose variability, inconsistency. Yeah, I noticed the Libre download talks about coefficient of variation, should be less than 36, and Dexcom and other CGMs use standard deviation, yeah, less than point. 50, but whatever metric you're using, it's a reflection of the bounce, but you can actually see this guy's fairly consistent overnight. Yeah. Uh, his numbers aren't that great, but at least the purple areas are fairly narrow. That's what you're looking for. And if we zoom in, this shows us on the left, we can kind of see his, you know, these, each of these represents a day. So you can follow, or this is what my blood sugar was at any time point in the last week, for example. And if you're, look, if you're this guy, you're looking at your, your you know, daily blood sugars, you can just see again, you know, those overnights are really just in the evenings, especially afternoons and evenings, he just goes high. So there's something going on during the daytime. He's just not consistent with what he's eating and something else is going on where he's high all the time. I like, I like that bottom right because it, it really shows how often he's getting low yeah. at night. Which is interesting because, you know, he's only low 1% of the time, but it's enough that you can see that he's having his consistent patterns of low. Part of that's like glucose variability. Sometimes he's taking more Lantus and maybe he's having lows overnight from that Lantus. Yeah, and that hypoglycemia is dangerous, especially for people with heart disease. Yeah. So, well, there you go. This is a gentleman who has some hypoglycemia. Um, so what do we need to just, you know, the chance to point out that there's new ways to treat hypoglycemia. These are glucagon rescue um, d approaches, devices medications that are new. So there's a nasal glucagon, there's a pre-filled syringe glucagon. These are all much easier to use than the old glucagon kit. Show them the old one. 
How, if, how's that work? Does that work pretty good? Oh, yeah. I mean, this one is like, if you live in a cave, this would be perfect for you. You got to push in diluting fluid, mix up the glucagon powder, the older glucagon kits, the glucagon wasn't stable. Suck it back up, make sure it's all you know in the syringe, and then give it. There's a lot of steps to do when you're trying to get someone out of hypoglycemia. And right? time is of the essence. Yeah. So every person with type 2, type 1 or type 2, and th those of you with type 2 on a sulfonylurea, mm -hmm. glibiride, glipizide, amaryl, you should have a glucagon kit and teach your loved ones how to use it. That's right. So some learning points from this case, Steve. Well, you know, I think it's important. You go through them. I'll, okay. I'll jump on. Well, number one, get engaged with your diabetes to reduce complications, right? So if yeah. you're inconsistent, you're just not really paying attention, it's going to increase your risk of problems, unfortunately. Missing insulin doses can do that, and it really can wreak havoc with your glucose levels, right? Because you need consistency, especially with those doses and with your diet. Otherwise, sometimes you're high, sometimes you're low. You're going to have a lot of that variability. And, you know, you're really the first person, this is you living with diabetes, right? You're, you can be the first person to realize that you're not reaching your goals, especially if you have CGM. It's just such a powerful tool. Yeah, you need to be the first person. Yeah. And basal insulin should not vary, should not, the dose should not vary much or at all from day to day. In other words, your basal insulin, once you're locked in at a good dose, it should be the same dose every day. So it's not one day you take 10, one day you take 30. Right? It's the same dose pretty much all the time. And you and your doctor your provider may work to find that dose. So, so you may, you know, over time be increasing or decreasing it. But on, from a day-to-day -day standpoint, it's the same dose. Hypoglycemia, unfortunately, is common. It's common at night, and most of the time people don't even know it's happening. And yeah, that's what's scary because yeah. you're sleeping. So you can have we're, low blood sugars without even knowing it. We're, we're discovering this because we have CGM yeah. now. Okay. Yep. We, we, okay. Re we ready for the next guy? Let's do it. Okay. Let me make sure I could see him. All right. Well, Richard is a 75-year-old retired lawyer. Now, he's got type 2 diabetes. I don't like helping lawyers live a long and healthy life, but I, I make exceptions here and there. So you can see the medications he's on. He's on Lantus. He's on an SGLT2 inhibitor. He's on a GLP-1. I mean, and he is doing well. So let's go through let's this go case through, yeah. briefly. He's on some a good group of medicines. He's got for a sure. great doctor, and he's got Dexcom. He must be one of your patients. Well, I use all CGMs. Yeah. So so um, average glucose 124, right? So that's looking pretty good already. Um, time below range around 1.7, 1.8 percent. So pretty minimal, and it's well below that that four percent goal. He's in target range 93 percent of the time. That's fantastic. Um, you know, the coefficient of variation, that's the one that we want less than around 36, and he's there, he's at 27%, so not a ton of variability. Uh, they also show the standard deviation, 34, so that's less than 50. Yeah, before we go to the next slide, yeah. I mean, we're pretty much done. Now, yeah. I think it'd be interesting to see when this gentleman gets low, even though it's a minimum amount of time. So, you know, when you look at the summary data, you don't see anything below that line, yeah. which is sometimes really good don't. to look at individual days, but I think... For, for for this patient, you just shake his hand, you talk about his favorite Peloton instructor, and you go on to your next patient. Yeah. Well, let's take you know, this moment to talk about some of the medications that he's using yeah, yeah. that are really helping him get to this these great blood sugars, but are doing so much more for him. And nowadays, you know, these newer classes of medication, we call them newer, but they've been around now for, in some cases, a decade. They're getting more attention now. They are getting more attention Because now. of new studies. We're learning more and more about how good they are yeah, for in yeah. protecting the heart and the yeah. kidneys and your other organs. So um, you know, let's talk about it. This is an opportunity to kind of talk about your heart and your kidney health as well. Yeah, you know, this brings up the whole topic of the ABCDs of diabetes care. It's a topic of an entire lecture in our video mm -hmm. vault. And, you know, of course, A is aspirin and A1C, B is blood pressure, C is cholesterol. But now we have data that shows that these classes of agents, SGLT2 inhibitors mm -hmm. and GLP-1 receptor agonists, you'll see some of the names on the sub subsequent slides, uh, th they have shown data on impressive reductions in heart and kidney disease. And these drugs are actually now being approved for people without type 2 diabetes who have heart and kidney disease, right. specifically congestive heart failure and chronic kidney disease. So the kidney doctors, the heart doctors, yeah. everyone's starting to prescribe these medications because of these really impressive benefits. It's the first time we're actually working together with our colleagues, to be honest. <laughs> They're coming to us, they'll find these great meds. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, this one class of medications, the SGLT2 inhibitors, just to kind of talk through those, 
the, the short version is they make you pee out the glucose. So they kind of keep it so you're not absorbing all that extra sugar that gets into your kidneys. Instead, they sends them out through the urine. And you can see how much um, sugar basically you pee out. That person's holding the, all the sugar cubes. That's how much you'll pee out one day. day on one day just being on these medications. So obviously it helps lower your blood sugars, but it has all these other benefits. And that sugar cube goes down your urethra. It's not, it doesn't hurt. feel good. <laughs> oh, it's dissolved. So you don't feel it. Uh, <laughs> SGLT2 inhibitors, you know, here's the names. Um, you know, these are the brand names out there. Um, we know, we know they lower the A1C, right? They lower your blood sugar, which is good. Um, they also help with weight loss. And this is something that we're not going to focus on today in this lecture, but there are other talks on weight loss. So check those out. They improve your, improve your blood pressure, right? So they're also helping in that regard. And importantly, they don't cause hypoglycemia, which is crazy, right? Now, so yeah, if you're using them with insulin or the sulfonylurea drugs, they, you can get low, but it's not due to this to medication. medication yeah. right. So you gotta be careful if you add them to other meds. Um, they help protect your heart. And in particular, if you have CHF and or if you wanna prevent CHF, which is congestive heart failure, these are good medications. And they're also really beneficial to the kidneys. Yeah, you know what? I got a call today from a good friend of mine from medical school. Yeah. He doesn't have diabetes and he had an episode of congestive heart failure. And I, I'm gonna give him a call later tonight, but I already told him He's got to get on one of these drugs. Yeah. Um, just as a disclaimer, each of these is different. So talk to your healthcare provider, figure out which one might be best, best for you. There are, of course, side effects with every medication. Um, so it's important to be aware of those. Okay. Yeah. Now, GLP-1s. I can just quickly go through this slide. I'm not sure there's any builds, but basically GLP-1 is a natural hormone that everybody secretes. When, when you sit down for a meal, it gets released from your brain, it goes down and it stimulates pancreas, uh, insulin secretion from your pancreas, suppresses glucagon uh, from the liver. And it, it basically, you don't want a lot of glucagon around when you're eating, because glucagon will raise your blood sugar, slows down the peristaltic motion of the stomach so your nutrients are absorbed slower. Super importantly, it goes to your brain and it is a appetite, I should say it is a, it suppresses your um, ability to eat too much. So it induces satiety. Yeah. That's so, what I'm trying to so say. You, you feel yeah. full and happy earlier without overeating, basically. Yeah, in that order. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and so they are now looking at these drugs in slightly higher than the doses that, that they use when they are approved by the FDA. And they are becoming the number one weight loss drug with the minimum side effects, mainly nausea as you titrate the dose, but that's why we titrate it slowly. Yeah, so powerful medicines. This is kind of what some of the brands are. And you know, I don't know, Steve, you wanna talk about these? Well, I would say, you know, we can build the slide, but if you look at the list, the laundry list, um, they do everything the SGLT2s do. Now, the protection on the heart is primarily, at least what we know at this point, heart attacks and strokes. SGLT2s is congestive heart failure and kidney disease. So these two, I have a zillion patients on both of these drugs. Yeah, and I mean, there's no reason you can't take them together unless there's a specific reason why, you know, why the drugs wouldn't work for you, but they work well together. Take so, us so, through these, you're such so, a learned guy. I'm just, I love, I love learning. Why don't you yeah. granularize and this <laughs> list? So to granularize, you know, some learning points. Being consistent with your medications will pay off in terms of your blood glucose control. So consistency is, is very important. The rewards for long-term control is a low rate of complications or hopefully none at all, but the whole goal of controlling your blood sugars is to reduce the risk of complications down the road. That's why we care about all this stuff. SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists have tremendous benefits to protect your heart and the kidneys in addition to whatever they're doing with your A1C, lowering your average blood sugar and keeping your time in range at goal. Let me just say that there's other lectures given by uh, Dr. Tricia Santos um, on our, in our video vault that spends almost the whole lecture on these two classes of yeah. agents. Yeah. I cannot emphasize how important it is for you. And even, even if you don't have an episode of heart failure, or you didn't have a heart attack yet, these are preventative measures right. too. And you gotta really work with your caregiver, uh, your healthcare professional, to have access to this. Mm -hmm. And with his help and her help, you can get it. Yeah, good. Another case? Yeah, okay. This is an 84-year-old retired physician. I know him quite well. I know his wife quite well. And he's had type two diabetes, you can see, for 30 years. He does have kidney disease. Uh, he's on Lantus at night. Uh, he's on um, 
fast acting with dinner, which we just added solely at dinner. You'll see his download. And the, having the CGM download helped us determine he needed fast acting at dinner because he was just bouncing up like crazy. And he's on an SGLT2 inhibitor Farziga because of his uh, chronic kidney disease. Good. Well, let's. So you, you guys added the Nova Log, the fast acting insulin with dinner. And then this is a download, I think, from after. So as soon, shortly after you yeah, added that. That's so right. let's kind of see how things you know turned out. So this is 14 days worth of data. Average glucose now on the new you know medicine is 155, which is pretty dang good. He's very yep. close to where he wants to be. Um, glucose, the GMI is 7%. So his A1C should over time be about 7%. And, you know, glucose variability low at, at around 24%. Very low. Very low. Now, the amount of time below range is 0%. That's the best percent. Oh, my God. Right? That's what you want. 0% if you can Zero. Get it. That's great. Um, time in range, 77. And a little bit, you know, the rest is above, but not that much time above. So here's this 24-hour modal day. I don't know what you want to say about this. I just want to say that um, you see what the time between dinner and bedtime, there is a more variability. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at other times of the day, the variability is tight. And his overall average is only 26% coefficient of variation. Yeah. And so if he could have better variability after dinner, his overall numbers will improve. But I'm not complaining. Yeah, because that's that, still his worst time. But yeah. he, looks, he looks great right there. And this is where you're given that insulin shot. Um, so, you know, he probably has a big dinner. That's probably his biggest meal of the day is my who, guess. Who eats the same thing after dinner right. every day? So right. you're post dinner blood sugars are going to be different. Yeah. Good. So it's a success story, you know. You know, this, um, he actually uses his CGM. He, he, he takes note of when he gives the injection. And so I think, you know, here we have a couple points where here he's given 15 units. And this is a download, also a download from CGM, but he's put that in, this data into it because he's keeping track. He's given a 15 unit injection at dinner time. Um, and you can kind of just see after that injection, his blood sugar is flat as a board. I mean, he, you know, it, it's nailing the coverage. For some of you type twos, uh, this is where a Fresa could be very helpful. Inhaled insulin. Yeah, we're yeah. gonna talk about that. So, um, you know, not everybody, he doesn't need a ton of insulin. He just needs a little help at that one time a day. Yeah, and he, you know, and he didn't need, he's not needing insulin three, four times a day. He just needs it at that big meal. So you know, everyone's different, yeah. that's the whole point. And I like the fact that he took the time to get out his Libre, uh, uh, what did it call it? Reader, reader. and input, his yeah. insulin. Yeah. It just makes it easier for us to understand the relationship between insulin, the time of insulin, and the subsequent blood sugars. Right. And hopefully it helps him too, because when he's reviewing this, he can see, you know, how that, that what that relationship is. He's a he's a veteran he, as he, yeah. well. He and, puts his long acting insulin in there too. So there's the 20 units of his long acting insulin. He takes that at bedtime. So he's got such a great doctor. He was the best doctor. Okay. Learning points. Please. Uh, these are mine, I guess. The CGM data, you know, showed the most important problem area in this case. And one shot of rapid acting insulin uh, with a single meal, in this case, the biggest meal, which was dinner time, is not uncommon in type 2 diabetes. Nope. And so it's, it's a very reasonable approach when you need that insulin, use it, use it when you need it. And that's a good, a really good approach rather than having to say, I need, you know, five shots a day. You might not, maybe one shot with your meals in addition to a long acting insulin. And, you know, and he's also on these other medications. So they're not mutually exclusive. You can use them together. The insulin timing is important. You know, you got to take it before the meal um, and, of course, be consistent. If he wasn't taking it consistently, he wouldn't have such good results. Sorry. And then, no, the last thing was just to limit your carbohydrate, carbohydrate intake at meals because that can be one of the big drivers of hyperglycemia, high blood sugars. Yeah, and just real briefly, this is just a picture of the Afresa device. comes in three different doses. Uh, there's an entire lecture on our video vault on how to use it, yeah. but it's rapid acting. It's easy to take and it's, made, it's approved for both people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. This slide just shows that the Afresa works very quickly to get in your system and very importantly to get out. So you have better post-meal blood sugars and you have less delayed hypoglycemia. Yeah, there's some, also some fact, faster acting injectable insulins. These are two of the examples, Fiasp and Lumgev, that are just a little bit quicker than, than the, the insulins that they kind of followed on, like Novolog and Humalog, um, uh, Lispro and um, Aspart. And so, you know, there's a little bit faster. So if you're someone who uses fast acting insulin with your meals, check these out. They're generally covered at the same prices as, as the other insulins. So it's, you know, if you have insurance, try it out. Last case. Yeah. 
54 year old CPA. I've known him for years. He got type two diabetes for 20 years. Um, and he has no complications. He's on Soliqua, which is the fixed combination of a GLP-1 and Lantus. He's on Metformin, he's on Jardians. Uh, take us through his number, Schaefer. All right, so 202 average, a little high, standard deviation of 52, not bad. GMI is 8.2%, um, you know. Not good. Not great, and then the time in range is very bad. Very, very low time in range, mostly high, right? High blood sugars a lot of the time, very high a lot of the time. So, you know, this is someone who, you know, we're using this fist, fixed ratio combination medication, and this is gonna be a, a really good option for this for this patient as, as we get the dose as figured we out. As yeah. we get the dose figured so, out. So, you know, yeah. You can kind of see, this is this is this patient, just kind of high. No, this is after the treatment was initiated, I think. It, uh, not Sorry. adjusted yet. You're not adjusted. Yeah. It's not optimized. But you can see, you know, blood sugars are high throughout the day. And with this, these fixed ratio dose combinations, you, you basically slowly increase the insulin and the GLP-1, but it's in one shot a day. And so he's going to get more and more effect as we sort of increase that dose until we find the right dose for him because everyone's a little different. And look, look, he's pretty much high all day long. Yeah. And, and there's the culprit. Uh, he set his alarm to go off at 250, defeating the whole purpose of so, the CGM. It's also turned off. <laughs> yeah, not only is it set too high, it's, not it's even turned up. off. Yeah, so use and, your alarms. Yeah, use you your alarms. Your alarms are your friends. Yeah. And during the day, if this if his alarms would have gone off, he could have done something yeah. about his diabetes. So he basically had a CGM on and was just closing his eyes. Yeah, you got to use the data. And and so alerts and alarms, we typically have people start off at, you know, somewhere around 80 to 180, mm -hmm. but you may start higher or you may start lower, just depends where you're coming from. Right, okay. Okay, so there's the, let's, why don't we uh, finish up our lecture? You take so us, if you're finish not, us off. If you're not looking at your CGM, give it back, because someone else might want to use it. Yeah, that's what, that's what, you that's son of a. Yeah, use the data. Your alerts and alarms are your friends, um, but you have to know how to adjust those numbers so, to find the right you know numbers for you so you don't get overwhelmed by it. Sorry about that, can you You're go back? good, but I don't know, what do we got? Yeah. That's it. That's it? That's it. Well, gosh, we're, we're finishing right on time. Just remember, we got the video vault, tons of great lectures, and there's a lecture that Schaefer and I gave on CGM and type two, it's a little video. Yeah. And um, there's also a lecture in the type one part of the video vault that says, think like an endo. It has a lot of the same information about reading a CGM, just if you want to hear it again yeah. in a different format. So with that, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay.